and connectivity to the restoration and protection of biodiversity and ecosystem functions. So even, even by yesterday, we had addressed quite a few of those questions. But we'll be doing some more today. So yesterday, uh, what we heard about for those who were unable to join the session was about connectivity within lakes, connectivity through cascades of lakes, connectivity across landscapes, over time and space, and the implications of connectivity for lake and species management, especially in relation to rare species and invasive species. Today, our five talks really come under two of those main headings, which is connectivity across landscapes and the implications for lakes and species management. So we have five presentations. Um, we're not going to this in any detail. These are the, obviously the uh, first pages of the presentations. I'll start off because it, apart from anything else, it's easier for me to continue um, with my screen shared and then we'll move on to the others. Uh, but there are, as I say, five things that we'll come back to. But for now, I just wanted to explain what we might call some house rules. Everyone, please can you mute your microphones and turn your video off until the question and answer sessions. For the speakers, could you now open your PowerPoint presentations so that they're ready just to share uh, when we come to that? But please don't share them for the minute. Well, I don't think you can if I'm sharing mine anyway. Uh, for speakers later, please turn on your microphones and your cameras for your presentation and share your screen when we're ready. And for the audience, please submit your questions via the Zoom chat. So hopefully everybody's had a practice already, so we know how to do these things. So what I'm going to do first is uh, I'm going to jump to, I'll give you a very quick overview of my presentation. So this is a presentation a little bit different to other, other people's because we've been looking at what the potential impact of changing connectivity is on uh, in this case, Loch Leven. And the change in connectivity has been suggested as installing a fish pass on the outflow. So we'll, the outflow is down here in the right hand corner, a picture of it. So it's completely blocked by this structure. So just to go over a little bit of the background, uh, water quality at Loch Leven uh, in, th this is in Scotland, this is our main study site. We've been working there for 53 years. But it, uh, in the 80s, it developed these really bad algal bloom problems like so many lakes, especially shallow lakes. And there was a newspaper article that said that uh, toxic blooms turned lock into shallow grave, which, which actually was a, a bit of a disaster really because people didn't want to come there anymore. And the impacts on the local community even in 1992 was equivalent of 2 million uh, US dollars uh, cost over three month period. Um, and there's only about 10,000 people live in the catchment. So this was a major problem for them. What we did then was we looked at where the phosphorus, we established that it was phosphorus limited. We looked at where the phosphorus was coming from. And before the problems, we could see that 20 tons a year was coming in from the, the catchment. And we managed to reduce that by 1995. So since then it's hovered around 10 um, tons a year. And we believe it's still at about that level. What's important perhaps is, is how it recovered. So between 1964 and 1985, the data showed that the lock was effectively operating up in this top right-hand corner, high chlorophyll, high phosphorus. We then reduced the amount of phosphorus going in and you can see that it moved down through this recovery trajectory towards the bottom here by 2008, 2016. It was operating down at uh, about 40 uh, micrograms per liter of phosphorus and about 15 to 20 of chlorophyll, which is exactly where we'd set our restoration target. So at that point, and even today, we, we were very pleased with what we'd achieved. The problem now is that uh, under the Water Framework Directive or whatever we use now instead of the Water Framework Directive, there is this belief that you should remove all barriers to fish migration because um, and, and increase the connectivity. And it's been proposed to install uh, sluice gates on this uh, outflow. 
and so we we concerned about what the effect would be on the water quality and so we have been using this um, pc lake model to look at what the likely impacts would be and the and the model fish that we've been using here is um it's a roach, which which we know actually uh, eats a lot of zooplankton, and it, and we also know that there are a lot, a lot of them uh, further down the catchment. So we ran the model, and what it shows is that if we leave things as they are in the spring, like many other places, we get a very big zooplankton population, and that creates a clear water phase by eating uh, the algae. But if we add low, medium, or high um, migration of these roach into the locks through a fish pass. The number of zooplankton drop because they're eaten by the fish and the chlorophyll levels increase uh, quite dramatically. So we then compared that to where we were on the recovery trajectory and what we found was that if we did this and we accidentally let something in, a some sort of fish that would eat our zooplankton, we would probably set our recovery of the loch back about 20 years. And from that we're concluding that it's not always better to be connected. Um, thank you for listening. I can take questions. Do you have any? Question in the chat, um, Linda. Okay, yep, yeah, okay. I can... uh, well, that's a long one. Hang on. <laughs> yeah, no, I haven't read it fully because it's just appeared. <laughs> uh, you mentioned it's just no fish migration because the model for results. I think it's just a comment, isn't it? There's something at the end. In your study, if you consider more details for species. Yeah. OK. Effect. Yes, that, that, exact, that's exactly right. So one of the things we're, we're going to look at is, is not what, what is a worst case scenario, but what if they put in a, a fish ladder that's selected for particular species? Because actually the main species that they want to get back into the lock are the, are the, are the um, salmon because they can no longer migrate into the lock and they're quite important for the fishery. And so that's what we need to look at yet. Next, if the results will change depending on which fish uh, we allow back into the lock and we have to be very careful how we do that. Any more questions? Yeah, there's another one in the chat. Um, okay. I'll let, you, yeah. you want, I'll let you read it. So it says, um, isn't there an ethical dilemma here? I mean, zooplankton fish and benthivorous or detritivorous fish were there in the lock before the gates, before the eutrophication, before the restoration. Is it a real restoration if you privilege water quality desired by people upon original fish assemblages? Yeah, the, well, so with the uh, catchment management group and, uh, and the loco owners, uh, we've had a lot of these sorts of uh, conversations. I would say that the, the problem is that downstream there are a lot of invasive species. There are also trout that are infected with a parasite that we don't have uh, the other side of the, um, the barrier. And so what we risk letting in is not a, a, a more natural population, but a, an infected trout population and, um, and roach, which really shouldn't be their invasive species that can do damage. And so it is a real ethical dilemma. Um, there are, on the one hand, the people that say, if you take away, if you remove the barrier, then everything finds its own level and it's probably okay. And there are others who are saying, well, if we've managed to keep the top end of the catchment, completely clean, unimpacted by invasive species and so on for since 1850, should we really take away the barrier and let everything just go up into the catchment itself? So yeah, it's difficult. Um, could it also be that you also miss the predatory fish that were historical present? Absolutely, and, and we could. Um, um, but what we have to remember is that the, the loch is not like it was in um, 1850. We know that around about 1850, the phosphorus load to the loch was uh, about five tons, which we haven't managed to get down to because people now live in the catchment 
And we also know that, for example, the water clarity was about five meters. Uh, we, ha we are now back at that about four and a half meters. We're going to lose all of that restoration if we potentially, if we allow the system, uh, the predatory fish to come into the loch. So it, uh, all of these things are being discussed with um, the local Envi Environment Protection Agency. And where we are at the minute is that they are considering bringing in a risk-based approach to removal of barriers to fish migration to look at the potential impacts um, and whether it's at, because once you've done it, it's very difficult to, to um, go back to where you were. So. Will you try to return? Uh, so the next question I think is, so, um, the previous question, could it be that you also miss the predatory, oh, we've done that one, sorry. Uh, will you try and ret the return of zooplankiferous fish and piscivorous ones? What says, what does the PC link model say about that? Well, we haven't actually looked at the minute. The, um, there are only about four species that have been excluded from the lock by the, by the sluice gates, and that's uh, char, char, and uh, salmon, and I forget the other two. Um, most of those are not zooplanktiferous fish. The only zooplanktiferous fish that we have there at the minute are perch, which have always been there. Yeah, and, and, the, and the pike is present in Loch Leven. Pike's well. present, yep. Okay, I think that's okay. all the questions, yeah. Okay then, so our next, uh, the next person who's going to summarize their, their talk is uh, Pablo Binder. So if you could just share your, uh, open up your PowerPoint and share your screen, please, that'd be great. Hello, good afternoon everybody. Do you hear me okay? Yeah, you're a bit faint, but maybe that's just me. I'm trying to share my screen, of course. All right, is it okay like that? Okay, excellent, thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, as Linda proposed, I will be uh, giving you a brief uh, reminder of the video presentation that I, I, I assume that everybody watched. So this is the, the, the work performed within the ecology, Aquatic Ecology Group in, in University of Buenos Aires, a grammar school in Argentina. Just a quick start to yeah, to locate our study area, and for you to remember, we are located in the central Pampas, yeah, one highest province in, in Argentina. Now, in your screens, you can see to the left the a picture within during our field samplings. So you can observe the the numerous amount of water bodies, uh, round shaped and and uh, very shallow, as you can as you can see. Um, Seen. And to the left of that picture, it's important or interesting to see that there's a kind of a connection pathway. In this case, it's a trial, um, a trial that is like uh, flooded. But well, it's important to have it in mind because these connection pathways are the ones that we are going to, to study. Not only the natural ones, but may some artificial ones may exist. And to the right on your screen, you can see the, um, the at the landscape level the amount of of water bodies that are splashed through, through the study area. So in this scenario, in where the geology says that there are long and heterogeneous periods of droughts and floods, we, we found that, or we hypothesized that the dynamic of connection and disconnection is critical of course for aquatic species. And in our study, we, we found, according to the characteristics of the sample water bodies, uh, two main groups. One of them that are characterized by being round shaped, that's indicated by less coastal line development, which have uh, in general absence of connection pathways, absence of water fluxes, and well, in the end, absence of fish. And on the other hand, we found like uh, complex and heterogeneous aquatic environments, uh, which had existence connections between neighbors, closer neighbors. And when we analyzed the water recurrence map, we found that they had like more permanent waters within the the time lapse analysis. So you might remember this, this simple regression where we found that the, the more number of connections within in a lake, the, the response was that there was higher fish richness. But of course, well, as we had lots of um, variable samples within the lakes, we try um, a 
a principal component analysis to try to organize and analyze all the variables at the same time. And this principal component analysis uh, explains about 75% of the variance of, of the situation. So it's a quite a robust model. And we find that the, the lakes mainly separate in, in two groups. On the top right side, we find the lakes that are bigger, we are peri higher perimeter, more complex indicated by a um, high coastal line development, more number of connection, and that there are lakes that are closer to their neighbors and exhibited, of course, more abundance and fish richnesses. So, and on the other hand, we have the, the lakes with the less morphology development and less fishes or no fishes at all. So, as a take home message or conclusion of our work, we found these uh, two groups of lakes, the one, the fishless lakes, we had uh, lesser or non connections at all, um, and that exhibited less complexity. And on the other hand, uh, the lakes we ha who housed fishes were the ones that uh, exhibited more coastal line development, complexity, and more number of connections, whether being this natural or anthropic. So we propose that these lakes that might be keeping fishes during draft conditions might, be, might play a, a key role maintaining fish during difficult conditions that then we can repopulate the whole landscape, the whole study area when water returns. Um, well, this is uh, quite uh, the work. I had some possible discussion issues or some questions that for me are not yet answered, that I can give you as a, as a kickoff for your meetings. But uh, these are the questions I have in mind to further analysis. So just to round up, like uh, uh, as we discussed in the, in the video and the conclusions of the work, we are needing a, a longer time-lapse analysis. Just to really remind you, the, the results we present here are from summer 2019 and summer 2020. Those years were like uh, different in, in, in hydrology, like uh, contrasting hydrology conditions. So we need to find if, if, the, um, if the water parish in, in which we found fish are always the same. So we can propose something like uh, permanent shelters or so something like that. And of course, we need to study connectivity levels across flood and draft conditions gradient. So to catch up our results and see if they match with some, not only two conditions, but a gradient of, of water in the landscape. Of course, you might be thinking that the special resolution when you saw the methodology that we used as SRTM digital elevation model with a 30 per 30 meters, may be inadequate for this very flat landscape. So we're proposing, we're working with uh, a bigger spatial resolution, whether it's a Sentinel-derived digital liberation model or lidar flights, but well, of course, we need funding for that. And just to round up, this, just to say that this uh, study is part of a bigger research line. In this conference, you can find four other studies presented uh, that study vegetation, buffer zones, land use, and so plankton regarding water quality. And so we are needing to cross data with these studies to, to underpin the relationships that we found in our two-year sampling between heterogeneity and fish survival without, for example, um, crossing with vegetation analysis. That was, this is further work. And of course, this is a work in progress and there are lots of ongoing undergraduate and PhD thesis in this site. So we'll be coming again with, with more and, and deeper results. So that's for me and okay, I keep open to, to your questions. Okay, thank you very much for a really nice talk um, and for being very brief, thank you. The, uh, we're just asking for questions on, on the chat at the minute if anyone wants to submit some. Um, okay, there's one from Dianica. Thank you for your presentation, Pablo. Can you explain more what the CDL is? How does it differ from the coastal length? What kind of connectivity metric is it and does it reflect the connectivity between water and land? Well, thank you for your question. The, the CDL is like a, a classic morphology uh, index uh, or variable for, for the lakes. It relates the perimeter with the surface of the water body. So it talks about irregularity of the, of the water body and thus may present or may, may suggest uh, different aquatic environments in, in our uh, study case in which we propose that different uh, species can live and survive when difficult times arrive, like let's say draft 
So it's not only the coastal lengths, but it's related to, to its surface, and it, in the end, it talks about the shape of the, the lake. Um, well, it doesn't show directly the connectivity between, um, between the lakes. It shows, yes, as you say in the question, sorry, I, I finished reading just now. It reflects the connectivity of the available surface uh, of, for possible connections between uh, water and land, and you say, yes, of course. I guess it, it provides more opportunity, doesn't it? Because there's there's a longer coastline or, or shoreline uh, to the land. So there's another question here uh, from Jorge mm -hmm. Sugado. Thank you, Pablo. Have you tried to assess other diversity measures besides richness? We have richness as a number of diverse species. We, just, we have diversity uh, results, which uh, relates and, and goes like parallel with, with the diversity. Diversity and richness go, go along. So uh, lakes with more connections or more connectivity, which exhibited more high richness, also show high, high diversity. So, so yes, and, and we are like ongoing fish samples. So, uh, we might have some more detail, but in general, diversity goes along with richness. Okay, thank you. Are there any more questions? Please put them into the chat. I have one question while while we're waiting to see if anybody else submits anything. What I was interested in is is you, you've looked at um, the wet year and then the dry year and what the difference is, but then what would you expect to happen in the next wet year? What would you imagine the recovery trajectory is? Well, it depends on when the wet year does occur and, 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 and how, how wet will be this wet year, you know, because uh, we found that uh, in this uh, short analysis of two, two summers, like construction summers, uh, if you remember the, the maps of the existing water bodies, they are, they are shaped, they are, shaped, they are um, surface and the proximity between them varied uh, significantly. So uh, if we have a, like an extreme situation where we have all the landscape flooded, as it happened uh, in some, some years ago, we might find that fishes will go along all the landscape because there are no barriers for this connectivity. Uh, so there is a question between when this wet year will happen, if it is ex exactly after the, uh, an extreme dry year, that may, that may provide some difficulties to recover fish in the landscape because the, these proposed shelters or reservoirs for fish might not be enough to repopulate all the landscape. Mm. But if we have a series of wet years, then we can take advantages of these uh, different uh, environment, aquatic environments. So the, um, the stock of fish will be higher and then the repopulation will be much uh, mm. higher as well. Because one of the problems with fish is that they, they're either alive or dead and they have quite a long life cycle. So they don't come back from resting stages like zooplankton and things like that. So I find that quite interesting. Thank you. So are there any more questions? If not, um, perhaps we can move on to our next speaker. Thank you very much for your, for your talk. Thank you very much. So the next uh, speaker is, uh, is Beata Zabo. who is going to talk to us about microbial stowaways. Can water birds facilitate the dispersal of aquatic microorganisms? And I'm really excited about this talk because it's the only one I've seen that have got rotifers in it. <laughs> so over to you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. I'm going to summarize uh, our recent study focusing on the uh, potential role of uh, water birds in the dispersal of uh, aquatic microorganisms. Uh, our main questions uh, were the followings. Firstly, we wanted to know uh, whether there is any difference in the community diversity, namely the local and regional diversity and uh, uh, taxa composition between a landscape of temporary ponds and uh, the water bird droppings in the same region. Uh, secondly, we, we investigated uh, what proportion of the abundant otus uh, of the ponds can be detected in the bird droppings in the region. 
furthermore, we investigated uh, that uh, the given sampling year uh, has any effect on the species composition uh, and the changes of uh, species composition. And uh, finally, we, we wanted to know whether the different water bird species can transport different communities. And this is a really interesting question because the, the different water bird species uh, can uh, possess different uh, life, uh, lifestyles. Uh, our sampling region was the uh, Zeevink region of Lake Noisedel. We sampled uh, 25 soda pans, uh, both in uh, 2017 and 2018 April. And uh, we sampled uh, uh, bird droppings from uh, 2017 from uh, for uh, uh, water bird species, um, gray lagoons, rough northern shoveler, and pilovacet. Moreover, we sampled uh, two sampled uh, bird droppings from two uh, species in 2018. These species were gray lagoons again, similar to the previous year, and uh, greater right fronted goose. Uh, the bacteria and micro eukaryote composition were identified uh, by uh, 16S and 18S RNA gene amplicon sequencing. During uh, our analysis, we focused uh, mainly on the gray lagoons dropping samples because this space of the water and avoid uh, the turbidity, for example. So, so uh, the gray lagoons was the species uh, which was we, whose droppings uh, were sampled in both sampling years. So we focused on on uh, those uh, samples during our analysis. As a summary of our study, we can say that uh, in soda pans we we observe higher local and regional diversity compared to the uh, gray lagoons dropping samples, uh, whereas uh, a higher compositional difference uh, was observed uh, in case of uh, gray lagoons droppings uh, compared to the soda pan samples. Furthermore, a remarkable proportion of the abundant taxa of soda pans uh, was observed in the bird droppings too. And uh, several freshwater, brackish taxa, and uh, also the typical members of soda pans in the Carpathian basin uh, were detected in the bird droppings. And uh, moreover, uh, the given sampling year had an imprint on the comp community compositions. Uh, when, we, when we considered the uh, different uh, water bird species, we observed that uh, uh, in, uh, in the first uh, sampling year, the in case of bacterial communities, the uh, droppings from the different water birds were different, whereas uh, in case of micro eukaryotes, the droppings from different uh, water bird species uh, were similar, except uh, the uh, northern shoveler samples. In the second sampling year, we, we sampled only from uh, two, uh, two water bird species, the white fronted goose and gray lagoons, and their droppings uh, were really similar uh, in, in both uh, cases. But we can uh, uh, see that uh, the solar pan samples were uh, different in each cases from the uh, bird dropping samples. Thank you for listening. Okay, thank you very nice for a very nice talk. Um, 
it's quite clear that it's not just hydrology that uh, connects these systems. Uh, does anybody have some questions? Please, can you type them into the chat? I've got a question if we're mm -hmm. through, yep. through any time here. Um, I, you haven't got the presentation a bit about when I watched the presentation, I, I saw that you had sort of, it's about 50% of the OTUs are from the ponds are present in the bird droppings, which is a really huge amount actually. So do you think that does highlight a major role for bird dispose, uh, dispersal of microbiota in fresh waters? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, that, do you think there's particular, I, I didn't, I haven't seen the detail of which O2, OTUs were best represented, but are there particular groups that were well, you know, very well represented and some groups that were less well represented? Yeah, we, at first, uh, before the analysis, we selected the, the, um, the O2s according to the most abundant uh, O2s uh, in the, in these soda pans. So maybe this could be a reason for this high, high uh, percent. But we think that, uh, that uh, they play a, a key role in the dispersal of these microorganisms, aquatic microorganisms. Okay, that's great. Thank you. We have a question from Luke. So Oh, well, you're doing questions now. Okay, off you go. So I can keep an eye on the chat for you. Sorry. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Hi, Beata. Uh, um, really, really interesting work. Uh, um, Thank I, you. I was a bit surprised about this high overlap because there was something, there was a worry that I had and that I wanted to, to, to check with you. Because in principle, if you look at droppings, you would expect that you actually in the birds get more a signature of their microbiome than of the environmental bacteria. So because you have a microbiome in the gut. So, so if you have such a big overlap, you would sort of either expect that, um, that the microbiome is really structured by the environment. And so that could be. And so a, a, a side question of that is, do you see a difference in the pattern for microbes and eukaryotes in terms of the overlap? And because that would give an indication because the, micro, the, the bacteria are in the microbiome, the eukaryotes do not grow in the gut. Mm -hmm. uh, so that might give, did you, did you play with that? Did you think about that? Not yet, but thank you for your suggestion. <laughs> it's a good idea. Thank but, you for but that. What is, but what is the, the, with respect to the first question, what is your idea about this, this but this overlap, do you think that the microbiome is unstructured by the bacteria in the environment? Yeah, as, as I said before, I, uh, we selected the, the O2s, uh, so we, we try to ignore the, the microbiome in, in, the, in the digestion system in the water birds. So therefore can be this, this high overlap Okay, so you it filtered everything out ponds. that was not in the environment. Yeah? And then you Sorry? So you filtered everything out that you did not detect in the environment? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We try to select, select them. Okay, but it would be good to, 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 um, uh, to show the overlap for the total data set too, I think. No? Yeah, thank okay, you. Thank you very much. Very nice. Okay, thank you. There are a couple of questions, but they're linked together here. So I'll just do them both at the same time. One's from Jorge Salgado and the other's from Helen Bennion. So they're asking, have you tried to measure flight patterns of the birds, uh, species across the lakes? And um, have you a feel for the distance that these birds are traveling? We haven't investigated these, this question yet, but uh, this could be the next uh, step. Yeah, we, we are planning to play with these patterns and the distances. Okay, thank you. So I have a quick question, which is that, so these things are in the birds droppings, but I'm just wondering how they get there. And so you used molecular analysis, so you wouldn't know if you were picking up resting stages from uh, sediments, if they're feeding in the mud, or whether they're, they're filtering these things out of the water, or, or do you know? Mm. Sorry, I, I don't understand. Okay. So, so the um, 
for example, if you if you found Daphnia uh, Daphnia in the uh, droppings from the birds, do you know if they've come from the sediment of the lake and it's actually resting stages, or whether it's come from the water and they're actually live stages? No, we we collected fresh water bird sampling samples, so so we think that uh, this is not from the sediment and from the water, but from the water bird. So, but but oh. we don't know that. Yeah. There. Yeah. Okay, that's fine. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, any more questions for Beata? No. Okay, thank you very much. Very nice talk. Thank you. And let's move on to uh, one of my colleagues, Phil Taylor, who is going to talk to us about uh, connectivity data and fish. So over to you, Phil. Thank you. Great. Can you hear me? Can I just check? I can hear you. Perfect. Thank you. Um, right. So. Yes. Okay, so this um, presentation was looking sort of behind the scenes a little bit uh, to some of these connectivity projects. So I'm looking at the, the connecting all of our data together as well as um, looking at connectivity of freshwaters with a particular focus on fish for this project. And for those who were here yesterday, you will have seen a, a couple of introductions to this Hydroscape project. But for those who weren't, this is just a, a slide showing the basic premise of the project and what we were investigating, which is that connected systems generally seen as a good thing for biodiversity uh, to increase freshwater biota present. Um, but there's the theory that a presence of stress, that connectivity can become a bad thing. Um, so the project was looking into that as to whether there's a sort of tipping point between the two, the two states. Um, particularly looking at uh, a group as a single group of species. So we've got dragonflies, uh, mollusks, beetles, fish, and macrophytes we were looking into. And the last stage of that project was looking at the fish, which is what this talk was about. Um, my initial role in the project was looking at creating these connectivity metrics. So we're looking at uh, lakes and lochs in the UK, and we were starting to think, how, how are they connected? So in, in a simple way, you've got a, a hydrological connection that they might have five other lakes within their catchment, uh, but they're also connected to their landscape. So you might look at um, what the land cover is like within a buffer zone around the lake. Um, so this slide was one of those sort of classic early project whiteboard experiments where you, you start drawing your lake and your rivers and your grid cells and all these things and try and work out um, how these things are connected, but also how you can generate useful metrics for analysis of those connections. Um, so that's the sort of idea of where we went. And then we had a look at the data sets we can use in the top left there. We've got lots of data sets in the UK that are really useful. So we've got this intelligent river network and um, the UK lakes database. We've got flow grids um, and information on river obstacles and barriers, as well as very detailed land cover data. So my job was to create these metrics. So we've got things like um, uh, length of river within catchment or uh, perimeter of ponds within 500 meters of, of the lake and there's all sorts of things um, and as you can see at the bottom there we ended up with over 600 different metrics which were then used across different analyses in this hydroscape project of which some were presented yesterday. So the next stage for looking at how uh, fish are connected to the hydrological systems and what impact stress might have on fish was collating all of our fish data, which actually hadn't been done before. So there were, there were three major UK databases that we managed to get access to. And part of this work was collating those records. Uh, there's a huge amount of data. And obviously with all data like this, it was a bit of a job to put it all together. But we ended up with over 600,000 individual records of fish being recorded across the UK. And our Hydroscape project was focused on, we were using 2007 land cover data. So we, we looked at five years either side of that. And within those data sets, over half of those records were from that time period. So a huge amount of data. And then it was a case of what, what are we going to do with it? Um, from a very simple point of view on the left, it, it was just a chance to look at what fish have been recorded in fresh waters in the last 10 years or that 10 year period. 
so we could make nice sort of things for different for comms and these kind of things where we we just show the different fish to people who, who might not be aware of what fish exist in fresh waters in the UK. But the second half of that was thinking about how fish work essentially and we've got a number of species of um, we've got salmonids and uh, eels and lamprey which, whose life cycle evolves around moving up and up and downstream uh, to lakes and rivers for their life cycle. So on the right hand side there you can see we started looking at how fish can move. Um, the purple map is showing you all of the obstacles in the UK. So we've got weirs and barriers and, and dams and all these things which, um, which the fish wouldn't be able to go through, or at least most of the time they can't. And then we could take that data set and intersect it with all of our rivers. And as, as soon as we, we start at the sea and as soon as we move up and hit an obstacle, we can say that a fish can't move any further than that. So we end up with a map in the middle there with the blue of, of streams and rivers that fish could get, get up to. And as you can see, all the inland areas of, of the UK pretty much are, are out of bounds, which is perhaps what you'd expect. And on the right hand side, you can then say, well, which of our lakes are reached by those rivers and therefore when, where can these fish get to? So we end up with this really nice data set of, of lakes that ha, are accessible from the sea within the UK. And again, that data hadn't been amalgamated before. And all of that gives us this, this really big data set. So we've got records of different fish across the UK. We've got their ability to move up and downstream and we've got all of these different connectivity metrics which we can start looking at all of these individual fish species and, and see what the connectivity can explain based on their abundance or the species richness of fish in different water bodies. I've just put this slide in, this is um, uh, Craig Wilkie at the University of Glasgow who's working on this stage and Stephen Thackeray, my colleague at UKCEH. They're now working on this data to look at look at what all of this explains for all of those different fish species across the UK, and it's a, it's a work in progress. I'll say I just presented at the first sort of slide of results, but we've got all of the statistical data on all of those species, and um, we're hoping to get a paper out soon explaining what we've found. So there's a summary. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Phil. So we don't have any questions in the chat yet. Would you like, please, to? send your questions through. Could you close your screen sharing, please, Phil? Thank you. Great. OK, so we don't have any questions at the minute. No worries. So I have one. OK. <laughs> Uh, I don't think it's a particularly difficult one, but uh, so I was just wondering if we have all these fish barriers and we think they're preventing the fish getting up into these upper catchments or these inner catchments. Have we looked at that in relation to where the fish are actually occurring and trying to decide what that actually means for the distribution? Is it stopping them getting there? Or are they already there? Or are they being introduced there? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a really interesting point. So though that fish database gives us that knowledge of where all of those all of the different species of fish have been recorded across the country and actually when we started looking at it things like salmonids are exist in lots of places that aren't connected to the sea um, now that's because they're they're introduced and their life cycle means that they're not going to live there forever obviously because they can't do what they they need to do um, but for sort of game fishing they're incredibly important for for lots of places particularly in Scotland um, so that's a really interesting point in terms of, of where do they exist and where sort of should they exist ecologically and how do we mm. how do we look at those two things separately? So that's one of the things we're working on at the minute. Because it could actually give us a derived data set for where they've been um, stocked or introduced. If yeah, exactly. So we, we do have that actually. So for uh, the key salmonid species, we have um, we have a data set essentially of all of the records which aren't connected to the sea and separately all of them which are. Now those ones which aren't in theory should all be either either stocked or spe uh, groups of individuals that have been have been blocked in essentially and are still existing. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not actually sure of the life cycle of a salmon but it's reasonably long I think. Might not be. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, does anyone else have any questions for Phil? Okay, so so we're moving on quite quickly. We'll have 
all of the talks. We've got one more to do, so we'll have them all done by about half past, which means that we'll have the, the last half an hour for general discussion of everything that we didn't get to say yesterday or anything that we want to say today. So um, we'll go on to the, to the next um, presentation now, which is Dianica uh, Veik, sorry, um, who's going to talk to us about um, smart nutrient retention networks. Over to you, Dianica, thank you. Thank you. Um, I will try to share my screen. Let me see. This should work. <laughs> Do you see my screen? Perfect, yes. Okay, great. Do you want to put it in presentation mode? Yes, okay. Great. Okay, thank you very much. So I presented uh, a talk about smart nutrient retention networks. That's a new management approach that's all about this concept of nutrient retention in networks um, and about how water quality can cascade down through the network. Um, and the aim of this approach is to do something about water quality problems and about resource depletion, and especially uh, focusing on eutrophication, so nutrient issues and the loss of nutrients um, because in hydrological networks, nutrients are eventually flushing out into the ocean and not available as a resource anymore. Um, but if we can um, remove them from, from the water bodies, we can conserve them and reuse them again. So maybe we can do something about the resource issue and water quality issues at the same time. So the idea of smart nutrient retention networks is to look at networks of water bodies, for example, a chain of lakes. And one important um, feedback mechanism that we can have in networks is that of nutrient loading on water quality and the effect that the water quality has on nutrient retention. And nutrient retention has an effect on nutrient loading again. And this is a positive feedback loop. So nutrient loading has a negative effect on water quality. In shallow lakes, you can think of uh, low water quality in terms of phytoplankton domination and high water quality when you have submerged macrophytes. And depending on that ecological water quality, you will have a certain amount of nutrient retention. So with low water quality, with phytoplankton domination, you will have little nutrient retention because these phytoplankton can capture the nutrients, but also flow along with the water. But if you have hurting macrophytes, they can help store the nutrients temporarily, but also in the long term. And then nutrient retention then prevents nutrient loading to downstream water bodies. So if you look then at the network of lakes, or chain of lakes, you might get a cascade of this feedback loop. So reducing nutrient loading to, to a water body that is in the range of alternative stable states um, can improve the water quality there and also improve the water quality in downstream water bodies. And this idea you can apply to more complex networks as well. And that is the idea of smart nutrient retention networks. So then a network does not have to consist only of lakes, but it can also be rivers, streams, reservoirs, any type of water bodies that are connected to each other. And you can locally apply measures to increase water quality and to increase nutrient retention and also to reuse and harvest uh, nutrients. And by that, you can address multiple goals. For example, reducing the loss of nutrients into the ocean or improving the water quality in the network. And you can improve multiple goals at the same time. And uh, once you have defined which goals you want to focus on, uh, you have to think in your network of local measures that you can take. And these can uh, be divided in three categories. One is hydrological management. The other is ecological management. So trying to improve the ecological water quality or harvesting of nutrients. And that can, for example, be the macrophytes that you can mow and uh, digest them and use them as a resource anywhere else. Um, and whether you can apply these local interventions depends on some local conditions, like which ecological state does your water body have and what type of water body is it? but also on a larger scale on network conditions or catchment conditions, like how much nutrients are already being loaded into the system. Can you change anything about that? Um, what does the socio-ecological system look like? Um, like what is the legislation, what uh, money is available and what socioeconomic trends are there for how to manage the systems. 
what are the, the aims of society with this system. So this is the concept that we develop now and um, what are now the next steps to really develop this into a management approach in practice. Uh, one thing that we think should happen is the development of models that include that feedback loop that I explained on a network scale and also management options. Now there are models available that can do certain bits of this approach and not everything together. So that's something we are now also starting to work on. But in the meantime, I think we can already start to include these four principles in our current management because there's already yeah, a lot of knowledge out there. And by focusing on management more on nutrient retention, I think we can already really improve our water management and also nutrient management. So that was in short what I presented. Okay. Thank you very much for a nice presentation. It's uh, again an, another slightly different angle on um, connectivity and managing connectivity to improve water quality. At the moment, we don't have any questions in the chat, so please uh, submit your questions if you have some. Can I ask a question? Yep. Anyway, it's good to see you again, Dianica, from your time at UKCH. <laughs> um, I just uh, wondered, uh, I think clearly a modeling approach is, is needed for this quite a complex sort of questions you're asking. But are there any, have you got plans for do, trying to do any empirical sort of validation? We, we have had wild ideas to start with experiments in the lab, but not practically yet, no. But it would be really nice to have first also lab experiments and later mesocosm experiments and field experiments, yes. Okay, no, I just wondered how you would that, take that next step. But I think that's a sensible approach. Okay, still no questions at the minute. So, so maybe I can ask one if that's okay. So a couple of things. Well, one is that, uh, well, when you, when you retain nutrients in the system and you're saying to, make, to retain them up in the upper part of the system, then there's a chance that they're going to be released and, and recycled and come down in a, uh, the system at a different time. And I'm just wondering how you, so you're talking about possibly recycling those nutrients, so possibly harvesting reeds and presumably harvesting or removing sediments and things like that. But what I see in a lot of places is that people understand that if you put reeds into a system, and then they take up the nutrients. What they don't understand is when those reeds die back, they return the nutrients to the system. And so they put them in and they say, don't they look pretty? And they come up every year and that's it. And of course that doesn't work. So how would you convince someone that, that this was a way forward whilst also convincing them that it needs to be a managed system? Mm, very good question. I indeed experienced this, this thought problem in wastewater treatment systems. Yep. Yeah, how to convince people and this is a difficult question. I think first it would be nice to, with this idea, to go to water managers. Um, and I hope water managers are more success skeptical to this idea and have more knowledge about this than the experience I had with like just households. Um, but I don't know your experiences if that's also water managers. <laughs> yeah, well. It includes water managers and, and one of the problems, of course, is that they can get the money for doing the landscaping, putting the, the plants in, but the maintenance budget is never there. And, mm. and so, so it, is a, it is a problem. And of course, in the end, if we can keep the nutrients in the catchment by somehow disrupting that connectivity, then I think, it, um, I think it, it's a good, you know, it's, it's right at the start. It was, it was, sorting it at source. But it is quite an interesting idea and uh, there are examples of data that, that could potentially be used to look at your model, I think, in, in a lot of the catchment-based uh, approaches that they're starting to use around the world to do this. So, okay, so um, there's another question he here um, from, sorry, Manky Chang. Uh, hi, Dianica, maybe not relevant, but if the goal to maximize retention meets conflicts with biodiversity, how would you balance it? Yes, I cannot directly answer that. Of course, it's dependent on the system. Um, yeah. But I think one of the goals that you should consider is not only indeed retention, 
but also biodiversity and climate change effects to take into account if your measures will affect that or not. But I cannot directly say like, oh, this measure will improve biodiversity or not. Uh, as we have seen in all the talks, also, yeah, doing things like connect, changing your connectivity to do something for biodiversity might also have reversed or counter effects if yeah, it's invasive yeah. species because of that. So yeah, it's it's a good point that we have to take that into account. I think often often it's a case of bringing in some sort of managed recovery plan, so that uh, as things as things improve you can you can kind of steer things into the right direction so there's another question just come up from uh jessica papera do you think you can convince them by pointing out that the network will help to prioritize which system to put you to put your your efforts in as you expect a cascading effect yeah i don't know if that question really relates to with linda's question but i think that's indeed an important part of the idea of smart nutrient retention network that uh, by looking at the whole network, you can focus your management on certain locations, so you don't have to manage your whole network. Uh, but that is probably something different than what Linda, I think, meant with uh, how do managers know how to maintain systems, how to keep managing systems on the long term. But if you can indeed focus your maintenance on a specific, specific location, it might be easier for them to do it than if they have to do it throughout the network. Any more questions, either in the chat or does anyone want to ask a current question directly? I'm thinking now actually related to Manchi's question about biodiversity. Uh -huh. If you focus your management also on that ecological improvement, so focusing on managing your system towards macrophyte dominance, that that will actually already improve your biodiversity in many cases. So there you would have a mutual benefit, actually. Yeah. I come in with a comment on that, if that's okay. And yep. I, I really like this concept and this idea of nutrient retention and that, but I do think there are some nature-based solutions such as harvesting algae that for phosphorus or for anaerobic digestion, whatever, where that could lead to biodiversity improvements as well as you know encouraging circular economy. But it is it is getting the sort of business models and and understanding what the impact of those management options would be ecologically. I think that, you know, I think it's a really nice area for a fruitful area for applied work on connectivity. I think things like harvesting algae, it's always a bit risky to focus your management on that because you don't really tackle the, the cause. So you keep just fighting, fighting the problem, um, although it might improve your, your ecosystem. I, I, agree with, I agree with that, but I think it's going to be very almost impossible to change the way we manage our landscapes that so that phosphorus doesn't seep into it in 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 ways that are still sufficient to develop algal blooms. You don't need huge amounts of phosphorus to develop algal blooms. So I think it it, it is good to think about some more innovative ways you can manage the landscape. I think that's true, but I think in most countries, still a lot of the phosphorus that's causing the problem is coming from wastewater rather than runoff from the land. Yeah. And so you know, we need to think how we fit all these things together. And, and of course, that's that's another connectivity to people is is that this, they convert to sewage. <laughs> they just discharge nutrients into, into our water. So there are once you start looking at the um, socioeconomic angle on this uh, connectivity thing, then it all gets incredibly complicated, doesn't it? So uh, we need to take that into account as well. So as there are no more submitted questions, I don't think, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to um, sharing my PowerPoint because there's a, a set of questions that we asked at the beginning that I thought would make quite a nice structure for for some discussion now. We have about 25 minutes if people want to discuss things more generally. So let me just go back to that. If I can find the right. Let's see if I can find my questions. No, we've done that. Okay, discussion topics. So these are the questions we asked at the beginning. So let's go through them uh, one at a time. Now I can't see the chat now. 
people okay so maybe people will just open up their microphones and ask questions then because yeah, i can't I'll see in the chat but yeah ideally people could just open their mics and chip in okay yeah okay and we'll we'll just try to manage that so so the the first question that we asked right at the beginning of all this was how can connectivity be measured and i think we've seen lots and lots of different ways of doing that and i just wondered if people would like to comment on what they think is the best way to go about measuring connectivity uh, i guess it's context specific as well as being a an absolute question so anybody would like to comment on that not really <laughs> is it dead? Okay. okay pablo go ahead go ahead yeah. No, no, um, yeah. about how connectivity can, can be measured. Um, in our work, we tried a lot of uh, connectivity indexes that are uh, on the bibliography. Um, some of them uh, good, uh, give good results. Of course, we have only two, two sampling years, so it's not uh, um, definitive. But um, at a landscape level, uh, whether at a landscape level and uh, at a small water body level, um, We've been trying lots of, uh, of measurements as like cohesivity, connectivity, the, uh, the mean distance or whatever. So uh, we, we have some, some, some results there as well that we might present and in the, in the next conference we, we can discuss a bit more about the degree of uh, how connectivity can be measured and the reliability of, of, of the proposed indices that exist in, in, in the reference. So, just, just to say that a little experience we had, like trying to address this uh, complex thing that uh, to be measured, right? Okay, thank you. Would anybody like to comment on that before I ask Aneta to follow up with her question? No? Okay, Aneta, would you like to uh, make a comment, please? Yeah, so I think it's indeed more a comment than a question, but so um, I was thinking, looking at these talks, um, so connectivity is always, often, not always, but often expressed in distance, for example, or, or um, yeah, units that, that don't differ per um, material. And what I mean by that is that I can imagine that connectivity might vary among different species, but also among different um, nutrients, for example, uh, the, the retention rate could mm -hmm. be different for nitrogen or phosphorus. So yeah, I'm, I'm curious, and also in relation to the talk by Dianneke, how the different speeds in connectivity could interact with each other and um, yeah, whether we can use that maybe in our management. Dianneke, would you like to respond to that? I think it's a really interesting question that I'm also actually wondering about. Whether, yeah, whether we can use these things to our advantage to, to yes. manage, yeah. Yeah, I think it's, I think another, it's linked to this is this, you know, we need to ask questions about the scale in the, in the connectivity, what's important in the scale in terms of how, you know, where do these nutrient retention measures need to be, um, uh, in relation to each other or species, you know, for species movements. And, and we saw that even in Robert Tachnik's talk yesterday about, you know, the importance of connectivity appears um, when you start to look at, I think he said less than 60 kilometers um, connectedness. But, um, and we've seen that in ours, that somehow we saw that the local landscape connectivity was more important than the hydrological cat catchment even. So I think there's lots of un unanswered questions on the scale that we need to look at and uh, and where that connectivity needs to be. And I think that following that based on, on, on what we saw with Helen's talk and, and also our talk is that connectivity is not only spatial but also temporarily. So and, and, that, and that's an aspect that usually tends to be neglected uh, but the temporal aspect is 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 really important, especially if, if if we want to think in terms of management and an ecosystem recovery or conservation practices. We need to understand also that temporal scale. Yeah, I think I think that's not only important for the biota, which is mainly what we've been looking at, but also as uh, as Janica said for the chemistry. It's really quite important that we know where it gets retained and where it's 
recycled from and so on to manage our systems and 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 then they have an effect on the biota too. I wondered if I could just come in, Linda. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I can't work out how to put my hand up. <laughs> well, I can't. I can't see how to do it either. So you just oh. have to. But everybody's just a button. <laughs> I'm butting in. They were just a link to that. No, I guess naively when we started the Hydroscape project, I had this sort of vision that we'd come away with this sort of, um, you know, almost like a connectivity metric. <laughs> Could then sort of plug into these larger scale data sets and we could sort of say well yes this site is more connected than this site and therefore we can then look say through the paleo records as to kind of how them uh, how impacted those sites have then been in relation to the stresses and these connectivity metrics but of course as, as Phil's talk has quite rightly pointed out you know the 600 plus metrics generated you know just from the hydroscape project alone so I guess what I'm, I'm sort of still grappling with is you know if we do have to kind of reduce it down to just a set of uh, a small number of connectivity measures that we think are the most important for our particular type of analysis. How, I don't, do we, do we have a feel, do you think, as a kind of community yet as to what those, what those very selected measures should be? Because I'm still quite lost on that. Um, Pat, and perhaps I could briefly reply just from the Hydroscape project that we did have lots and lots of metrics, but lots of them were interconnected with each other uh, or at least when we looked at looked at them um, things like length of river and number of ponds for example often just correlates so yeah. actually what the project did I think is made it clear that you often don't need to look at very many the, the variation in, in presence of species is explained by quite a few metrics however from my understanding across the different species groups those significant metrics are different um, and therefore, it's quite the, the suite of metrics needed to explain, you know, biota across the UK is still going to be quite large, but you mm -hmm. won't need many for each. But that's just my understanding. I think. Yeah, no, that, that's that's useful, actually. For yeah, I mean, I guess you, you're trying to perhaps thinking too simplistically about it. Clearly, there's there are complexities and you've got to choose your, your metrics according to your particular say suite of, um, you know, suite of analyses, suite, because obviously our plan was to look at them um, in relation to diatoms and then in relation to macrophytes. And as you say, they, you know, they may be different uh, requirements for looking at those two different types of organism groups, mightn't they? But uh, no, that's helpful, thank you. That's all right. And uh, the other thing to say, I think, is that sometimes what seems to explain the data isn't very logical. So you, you might find that the most explanatory variable doesn't make really makes sense for the ecology of what you're looking at. So there's probably something else that it's connected to. Um, so yeah, I think it's, um, it needs a, an expert's eye to unravel these things sometimes. Mm -hmm. I thought what was really interesting that what not dominate the discussion, what was interesting that came out of some of the talks yesterday as well was the degree to which perhaps eventually eutrophication or a pressure as strong as that completely overrides connectivity anyway and I thought that you know when we're trying to look at these bigger scale data sets does the does the kind of connectivity just get kind of shunted down down the list basically you know do we still have this I remember John Anderson always describing it as the sort of sledgehammer blow of eutrophication and that sort of you know connectivity just sort of sit, sits under that really but anyway perhaps that's moving on to one of your other questions actually Linda so I'll stop there. <laughs> I, think, no, I think we're doing a good job at all three of the first questions, so carry on. <laughs> uh, does anybody else want to comment on that? The impact of stresses and how these uh, connectivity relationships are changed by them? Yeah, I think that's, that's, that's true. Um, my sense, at least in, in shallow lakes, my sense is that eutrophication at the end is going to win. <laughs> It's, it's, and it's spreading everywhere. So it's kind of like it's metastasizing across the landscapes and, and, and eventually it's going to, to win the battle. Because connectivity can be positive when you have good, good legs or when you have positive things to, to spread. But when it's the other way around, then, yeah. then, then maybe what we're going to see a, in some in some side, it's it's an acceleration of eutrophication because of of, of connectivity. I think that's absolutely right, and I think it also applies to things like invasive species, um, and uh, and it, 
it's, it's, it's okay for everything to be connected when there aren't external stresses, pressures that are human induced pressures. But as soon as there are, then it can increase the impacts of those, whether it's eutrophication or invasive species. So we need to really think whether increasing connectivity, which is which a lot of people are proposing to improve, uh, well, to go back more to pristine conditions, whether that actually is a good approach right now. Anybody else would like to comment on that? I think it's more it's more interesting if um, <clears throat> if you start thinking about climate change, for example, because uh, because that maybe doesn't it doesn't get uh, propagated through the system by by um, by connectivity in some ways, but if it's warming the water up in the uplands or melting the ice sheets or something, then then you'll get at least a temperature effect coming down through the water bodies, but also it's um, it actually affects climate change is not only temperature, lots of people think it is, but of course it also affects rainfall, the way that rain uh, comes down, the energy in the rain and the uh, flows and, and, and the floods and droughts. And so that alters all these connectivity measures that we've been calculating and can have massive impacts on, on the, the water bodies. And I think maybe Annetta would like to say something. Yeah, well, I, I'm just thinking about the talk uh, earlier today by Luc, where he he talked about the patchiness of, of urban areas where it was warmer and the, mm -hmm. and the surroundings where it was colder. And I think in such lowland regions, maybe where uh, species can migrate uh, uh, two directions, basically, it's not, yeah, it's less river uh, directed, I think, than, than, for example, in a hilly area. Um, maybe this, this patchiness in, in in, in water temperatures could prepare us actually for the future because there are already regions where it is warmer and species can maybe evaluate to the, mm -hmm. to the future. Um, that was just a thought. Yeah, one thing that, <laughs> that struck me was that, uh, I mean, in a lot of temperate lakes, species have to survive from about two degrees to about 20 in any case. And, and maybe there are different Genotypes or, uh, during the year that can, that uh, can effectively move around uh, and repopulate if if the ones that prefer cold water disappear. Although I don't know too much about it, it's just something that struck me when Luke was talking. No, you're you're right. Also, temporarily, of course, each year uh, they yeah. experience a, yeah. a, a huge temperature difference. That's right. But yeah, so I think that the ones that are in the city uh, experience more extremes towards the heat, mm -hmm. towards the warm side, perhaps. Lawrence? Yeah, I'm just coming back to this question that people are commenting on about, you know, <laughs> eutrophication or human impact wins the battle. We, you know, there is this tension between a lot of, um, I guess, from the migratory fish community to remove barriers in rivers and stuff, but I think they do come from a river perspective and maybe the shallow lake perspective where eutrophication is such an issue and trophic um, top down and bottom up processes are so crucial that, that that view isn't really taken into account in the whole, you know, whole idea of removing barriers and, and things. So maybe mm. we need a bigger voice in, in that to say that, you know, ideally, yes, in low stress environments, it's, it's, a, it's the thing to do, but until you have less nutrients in the system or don't have invasive species, then maybe we do have to hold back on these sort of broad decisions on just re removing barriers. Mm. I mean, it's a bit of a, it's a really tricky one because you can see the, the reasons they're doing that, but I think it is, comes from a river uh, perspective. Yeah. I think it doesn't, it's not even a good thing to do in rivers unless you've really looked at what the potential consequences are going to be. Does anybody want to um, comment on that? Uh, um, perhaps from a, a tropical perspective, everyone that's spoken so far is very temperate. 
No, okay. So I think for in Phil's data set, for example, it'd be quite interesting to see um, whether the extent to which the barriers in the rivers that he's identified and, and shown what's above and below isn't connected very well, how much those actually prevent the, the spread of invasive species because we have invasive species maps as well. It'd be quite interesting to look at the two of them and see if they really are preventing uh, reducing the connectivity and preventing these impacts or whether they actually are, uh, it doesn't make any difference, whether it's actually people who are more likely to be introducing invasive species than natural connectivity. I've got a question for the audience. That's, there's mm -hmm. certainly people in the audience who um, are much more familiar with um, theory on connectivity and meta-communities, and we've seen those talks, plenaries today. I, from what I sort of see from this, that a lot of that meta-community um, theory uses just numbers of connections and pathways of connections, but doesn't often um, sort of add qualitative uh, information on those connections and, and so that's what we're doing slightly differently in the hydroscape project we're looking at you know the amount of lake area or lake perimeter upstream or pond perimeter pond area upstream um the types of river length upstream and things uh, I, I i i may be completely wrong but that's just a question out there is is meta community theory exploring you know exploring that further the quality of those connections I, th I think when you when you build the model, you can include all this. When you build the network model, you can include all this information also within the within the model. So, so I think there's a lot of studies that have done this already. Okay. So it's it's prior to 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 the statistical analysis where you put all this this information before computing the the network analysis. Okay. Uh, sorry, Lauren, just a question related to your, to your statement. How, in, in, in what are you thinking when you think about quality of connections? Because we can speak about uh, tempor uh, temporal variables. I, I, I always thinking about quantitative, I know, and you, you will tell me that. But um, when, you're, when you said quality of connections, uh, is it because they last long, because they are bigger, because they are more permanent, because they are bringing different or, or richer things from one side to another? In what are you, what are you thinking? Yeah, I was, I was thinking things um, as well as, you know, obviously you've got numbers of ponds or lakes upstream or whatever, but you've also got some of those lakes upstream are nutrient poor, some of them are nutrient rich. Um, and so it's, you know, and they will have very different influences. Some of them have invasive species, some that won't. So it's just that the fact that they will have very different influences um, uh, in terms of the connectivity. So they, they have different, it's those qualitative characteristics of them. I just wondered how easy it was to, it's adding another layer of complexity into these network models, isn't it? Yeah, yeah I'm sure I'm, I'm thinking also not about uh, what you have just said, but the, the, um, the receiving environment might alter uh, this uh, assigned variable for one or two different uh, receiving uh, environments will be qualitatively different. Uh, so it like, it's, yeah. yeah, extremely complex, yeah. <laughs> okay, so what I've done now is I've, I've um, closed down my PowerPoint with that list of questions because I think we're covering them all anyway, so that we can see a little bit better what's in the chat because I couldn't see the chat while I had that open. So if people feel that they would rather not speak their question, they would rather uh, put it into the chat. Um, we can now see that properly. So please go, go ahead and do that. What that does mean is I've lost my list of questions. <laughs> Linda, uh, can you take a picture of the screen, of your screen with everybody here? Then we okay, can post yep. in, a, in a social medias. 
I, okay. I have taken two pictures of all everyone here. Yeah. If, if people don't yeah, like. Please. So tweet, but we need we yeah. we need the pic we need them to open the cameras. So yes. That's sure. a good idea. Yeah. Okay, just yeah. doing that now, and Lawrence can do the same, and then. So who do it? Jessica. Uh, okay. Yeah, we're getting there. Anna. And after you take the picture, I would like to say a few final words, okay? Okay, yeah. Well, okay, you've got two seconds, everybody who hasn't opened their cameras to get their cameras open, and then we're gonna take pictures. Okay then, thank you. We're just going to do that now. All right. Uh, uh, just one second. Okay. You got it? Yes, all except two people who seem to be very shy. <laughs> they went to the toilet, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you, everybody. Well, I would I like to thank and congratulate Linda, Lawrence, and Igor for this excellent coordination conduct of this session. I hope you guys enjoyed this session as much as I did. This was one of the few session proposals we got with the theme very much closer to the central theme of the Congress. Then I take this opportunity to thank Linda, Lawrence, and Nigel or Nigel? How, how Nigel, Nigel. Nigel for Nigel. proposing this very nice session and, uh, and to invite all of you participants of the session to submit your work for the special volume of Hydrobiology with the contributions from the Congress. Okay, thanks and see you tomorrow, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Bye, everybody. Thank you for your contributions. <laughs> Thanks, Linda. Thanks for a nice session. Great. Bye.